Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, our guest is Chris Curran. He runs Podcast Engineering School and has some great advice for us, whether you're a newbie to recording and podcasting and mixing, or you've been doing it for a while. You'll probably learn something. Plus, at the end of our show, we're giving away two of these uh, Echo Dots. So stick around. You're going to want to find out who won. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcast Supply Worldwide, where it's Christmas for the caster. Save up to 61% whether you're a broadcaster, podcaster, voice caster, or everything caster at BSW. By the new Omnia Bolt audio processor. More processing power in one RU than others give you in three. And by the new Ruby console from Lavo. With auto-mix smart mixing and a context-sensitive user interface. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted that you're here. We have an amazing show. I can't wait to tell you who our guest is. Uh, I talked to him, uh, met him a few months ago at a podcast convention, and this dude is an engineer and a podcaster and a recording engineer, it's, and it's going to be a really, really awesome show. We've got great advice for you, and some. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have a war story or two with you know <laughs> overcoming difficult situations, so it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Uh, I'll introduce our guest in just a moment. But first, let's bring in our co-host, the loyal man himself from the New York City area. It is Chris Tobin. Welcome in, Chris Tobin. How are you? Well, thank you, Kirk. I'm doing well. I'm uh, just uh, kicking back. You know, it's nice, balmy temperatures today. I think it was 35 degrees Fahrenheit. It was good. It was good. It's nice and uh, brisk as I walk along the uh, park this morning. <laughs> brisk. <laughs> is that the nice way to say it? Well, yes. I mean, it's a family program. I know this is not safe harbor time, so I'm just going to be nice about it. Yes. <laughs> it's cold here in Nashville, too. And uh, the long term forecast for here in Nashville is not not calling for any big rise in temperatures. It's going it, to, I mean, we're in, we're almost to the first day officially of winter, but we are already in meteorological winter. That's, that started, uh, what didn't that start in November? I forget. Mm -hmm. I'm a meteorologist. Perfect. I should Something know. Like that, yeah. Yeah. I just we're find it entertaining when I, yeah, I, I, Went to bed last night, retired for the evening, and on the forecast, they said, oh, 10% chance of precipitation in the morning. I got up this morning around 5.30 in the morning, 5.30 a.m., and discovered there's about a half inch of snow on the, the balcony and the trees. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, uh, okay, obviously something happened during the overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, here in Nashville, um, I was doing the weather this past weekend, on the local NBC affiliate, it's kind of like my little side job I do for fun, and luckily I make some money at it too. But um, the difference between what some of the models were calling for and what the local weather office was calling for. The local weather office, for example, totally poo-pooed the idea of any rain on Tuesday morning, this past Tuesday morning. And yet both the NAM, the North American model, and the GFS, the Global Forecast System model, were, were obviously sweeping rain through here on Tuesday morning. So I was a little undecided what to do. So I, I didn't put it in the graphical forecast, but I sure did mention it. And uh, we got the rain. It, it was now wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot, and it wasn't expected to be a lot. But it's interesting how, you know, these models disagree. Uh, there's the European model, which usually moves things along quicker than the uh, the, the American models. And uh, well, yeah, that's a it, is you know modeling. We, we ought to talk about that sometime. Chris Tobin, that modeling is something that we actually do do in broadcasting. We model coverage, for example, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's, that's the news anchors on TV. Oh no, sorry, that's a different modeling. <laughs> different modeling. <laughs> we no, you're right about the modeling. I, pr I did coverage, work. Yeah. I worked at a yeah. I worked at a radio station. Uh, our weather guy, a local weather guy. I worked for the local cable television news channel, and um, Joe Chaffee was his name. Uh, is, is his mm -hmm. name? Uh, Long Island meteorologist, and he would always come to the radio station, or we'd have him on the phone or ISDN, and we talk to him offline and just say, "What? How does this all work?" And I used to call him the weather gorilla because he was all about the weather. He just loved it. He was science. <laughs> he was meteorologist. <laughs> he went full tilt. I mean, he could tell you things. He goes, "Look, here's how it's going to go down," and I cannot tell you how many times he was so close to accurate there on long island you have water on both sides of the island north and south yeah. shore and the yeah. temperature difference the delta is is huge at times and he would mm. he could actually tell us during the winter months okay those of us on the south shore uh you know freeport babylon wanta that kind of thing hey you're gonna get rain sleep those of you on the north shore oyster bay great neck manhasset you will see snow and i kid you not 
we would take the van <laughs> and drive on a north-south pattern right across the island. And sure enough, it's sleety rain on the south. And as we're coming up over the hump past what's known as the Long Island Expressway, 495, and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden it starts snowing as we go up into the northern part. So wow. it's, modeling yeah. is an interesting, you know, it's, it's part of the, inter- I guess, part of what meteorology is about. But he was about the science, though. He would look up in the sky, look at the clouds, look at all the various, I guess, um, uh, meteorology devices that you use to gather information, your data. And he would just come up with stuff and be like, no, 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 that's where the service is claiming this. I call the guys in Upton, not even close. We're going to go with this <laughs> instead. I'm like, all right, you're challenging the guys out there with the big balloons and everything else. God bless you. Have fun. But, uh, <laughs> right. but I just, when I, when some, some folks that when they're into it, man, I'll tell you, they can really, they call it nicely. Hey, I, I, you know, I could talk about this for a whole hour, but we can't because we have a guest. So we're going to get yes. to our guest. Let's bring our guest in. Our guest is Chris Curran. Chris, uh, well, Chris, give us, the, first of all, hello, welcome, and let's hear the elevator speech about Chris Curran. Yeah, so happy to be here, happy to connect. Uh, I live in Colorado Springs. I'm an audio engineer. I worked in the music business for many years and and uh, have a bunch of album credits and all that cool stuff. And then about six years ago, I got into podcast production, and that's what I do now. That's my main business is I produce podcasts for mid to large companies as well as some business authors. And uh, so podcasting is my life now because I also started podcast engineering school, which I'm actually teaching people how to produce podcasts professionally so they actually sound good and that it gives the listener a good experience. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm just, I just love podcasting. It's just great. You know, after 374 episodes, I figured it was time we got some professional advice on this show <laughs> so we could, so we could sound better. And that's why we brought you on. <laughs> Actually, I do hope to, I do hope to learn something. And this is, this is for those of you watching and listening, this is going to be a show. If, if you're, if you're new to podcasting, new to recording, uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a nuts and bolts show. Chris is going to have some great advice for us on, uh, you know, just uh, how to, you know, mixing, uh, fixing, how to use plugins and th- things like that. What are his, some of his favorite plugins? Uh, if you're starting an au- audio production, Chris, Chris can take somebody who's at the basics level or somebody who's at, you know, mid range, uh, and, and, and move them on up the ladder and get you, get your skills a, a whole lot better. I'd love to, we're going to jump right into it. I'd love to, but we're going to, quickly hear from one of our sponsors. Uh, so Chris Tobin and Chris Curran will be back with us in just a second. Uh, our first sponsor is uh, my friends at the Telos Alliance. Now, I got to give you a disclaimer. I work for these folks, so I kind of know about what they do. Uh, and one of the things that the really hot topic that's been been hitting us uh, for the last few shows is that of virtual radio, virtual radio. And what does virtual radio mean? Well, you know, it really it does mean different things to different people. Uh, we've even got videos, uh, and we, I think we have another one still to, to, to publish, about what does virtual radio mean to you? And it can mean a lot of different things. For example, um, the BBC, they did kind of a virtual radio project using uh, a lot of Telos Alliance gear, wherein they, they had to refurbish um, something like 38 studios, well, 38 locations, which is double that number of studios. So it's what, 76? 76 studios that needed to be refurbished. They were old and decrepit and just needing fixing up. But they didn't have the manpower or the money to actually totally refurbish that many studios. So what BBC did is a project called Vilor, V-I-L-O-R, which means virtual local radio. And uh, for the people, for the operators, for the talent, for the board ops, there's almost no difference. They still, if if you, about uh, about two thirds of their stations have now been converted over to the Vilor system, and what it does is the uh, there's still uh, there's still audio consoles there. They go in, they sit down at the same kind of furniture, and they have modern audio consoles. They they happen to be Telos uh, Fusion consoles from from the Axia uh, brand name, uh, Axia Fusion consoles, and um, but ev- most everything else is not at the studio. It's in London or at the backup location. Uh, they have two different data centers. And in the data centers, they are running uh, computer blades that are running the mixing engine, that are running uh, the phone system, which is a Telos VX, and they're running all the IP codecs that get audio everywhere back and forth around, uh, that which isn't done uh, uh, linearly. A lot of it is live wire. But when it's not live wire, uh, it's going through a, a Telos iPort, 
And that's run. And all of these are running on blade hardware, uh, very reliable military grade blade hardware. I mean, this is good, good stuff. And they, therefore they were able in each of their data centers to concentrate, you know, what would be literally racks and racks of equipment and power supplies and, and uh, switches and all this kind of stuff. They were able to, to get this down to just a few. I'm mean, honestly, they can run it out of one rack. One six foot rack in London can run all the radio stations out in the field. They have plenty of backup though, uh, and redundancy. So they actually end up taking up about three or four racks uh, in London and at their backup location uh, so that each studio out in the field, they get a surface. They, they get the usual work service. They get microphones and headphones and all that. Some things are mixed locally at the local studios. Things that, you know, need to have no delay, like, you know, microphone to earphones, right? Uh, that that just stays local. Uh, and then the feed of that goes on to London. Bottom line is it's really cool. And that's just one way of virtualizing. It's kind of an early way of virtualizing. Well, there are more methods coming down the pike. Some are being, some are implemented right now. For example, uh, a lot of people are starting to use this new product from the Telus Alliance called the IP tablet. This lets you create a console on either a tablet or a touchscreen um, and lets you just create what you want. If you need seven faders, you can have seven faders. If you need three faders, you can have three faders. You can put your phone system on this. If you need three phone lines or 12 phone lines, you can design that individually. If you need two codecs to come in on this, you can have that too. If you need your automation system to also show up on this tablet, well, as long as your automation system can spit out, can talk to you using HTML5, and there are several now that do, and plenty more are on the way. Then you can just do this all on a tablet, on a on a uh, on a smartphone, um, uh, and also on a big touchscreen. So we've got examples of all of those. Bottom line: find out about this. Virtual radio is coming, and it doesn't mean that there's nobody at the studio anymore. It, it could mean that, or it could just mean that the people in the studio have a lot less stuff in their way, and the engineers get to take care of stuff in a different way than they used to. Uh, it's really efficient. It's very cool. And I'm telling you, it is the future of where radio is going. Main, a, a little little by little or a lot at a time, I think you're going to see it snowball at some point. And, um, I, and, you know, in the long run, it's not a bad thing. Sure, you can still have local studios with traditional gear, but you can also do amazing things with touchscreens and tablets uh, and automation that's in the cloud. All these things are coming. And the Telos Alliance is really on top of this have products right now and a lot more cool stuff in the pipeline. So if you would, check it out at the at uh, telosalliance.com. And uh, let's see, uh, I think I, so I sent that that link along there. If you go to Telos, oh, uh, you know what? I'll put the link in the show notes. It's actually success.telosalliance.com slash virtual dash radio. Well, that's a lot. So let me put that in the show notes. You can click on it or you can just go to telosalliance.com, hunt around, find the virtual radio uh, page and read all about it, including uh, Frank Foti's uh, interview about virtual radio. Thanks to Telus Alliance for sponsoring this week in radio tech. Appreciate it. Okay, Chris Kern is with us, and Chris, let's just jump right into this. Uh, some of the things that we talked about. Well, you've got a, a company, Fractal Recording, which by the way, great name. I think you know the audio sounds great, no matter how far back you are or how close you are. It's Fractal. Is that, <laughs> is that what it means? That's awesome. I love fractals. I love and I love sound. I mean, isn't it amazing how Sound is so important in every area of our lives, including anything with video. Obviously, there's sound, too. So I just love, uh, you know, getting good at sound is so important. Um, and there's so many ways to do it. One of the things about sound, and, and Chris Tobin will absolutely attest to this, when, when, you've got, when you've got a video show, video and audio, if the video's bad, your brain can handle it. If the audio's bad, oh, you just want to tune away. You just, unless it's something you've just got to hear, you don't want to hear it. Yeah, it's 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 a big, you know, in in the podcasting world, it's sort of this debate that keeps on going. Is that, you know, some people will say, don't worry about the sound or your tech or, or your tech. Just start your show and talk about what you love to talk about. And then there's guys like me and, and all the the good podcast coaches out there will say, no, the sound is important, but you only have to sound. And again, this is for novices. You only have to sound good enough. You don't have to sound yeah. like a million bucks, but as long as it's not too distracting for the listener and doesn't sound like you're in an echo chamber and all this kind of stuff, uh, 
that's okay. But man, it's important. I I would agree with that. And uh, and Chris um, Tobin, you you would probably uh, agree that getting a good sound is probably easier now than it ever has before. But there's still some fundamentals fundamentals that that people need to adhere to. Just just mic technique that really hasn't changed in thirty or forty years. You you need good good mic technique. Uh, Chris, we're going to let Chris Curran jump in on this, but Chris Tobin, why don't you kind of preface that part of the conversation about, about uh, how uh, the tools today are fantastic. You can get perfect quality, but you still need to use them right. Uh, well, that's true. You, um, today, it's much easier to get a microphone like the one Chris is using, which has got a audio out and USB output connection. You can put that into a computer, your laptop, desktop, whatever you like. The trick is when I when I help people out that call me up and ask for a podcast, you know, guidance. Um, two things: one, microphone technique is important. Understanding how to use it, what to listen for. The second thing is monitoring. How do I listen? Now you could use uh, earbuds if you'd like, the little tiny ones you get with your uh, you know audio device, or a pair of headphones. Now I say this only because I have worked with some cameramen who have shot video. And tell me the audio is just fine and they're using these little earbuds, you know, that you walk around the subway with. And I get the video product back and I'm like, you really didn't pay attention. And <laughs> so those are the two things I always try to stress with folks. Put a pair of headphones on, listen to what you're doing. Like I'm talking to the microphone in this manner and you see I'm a little off center. So if I'm if explosive, popping my peas, if the phrase, as the phrase goes, it sort of doesn't really get picked up if I talk into it and pop, 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 go away. I try to explain to people as the differences. Those two subtleties, if you can get past that, or not past it, understand it, I'm sure Chris can embellish even farther, or further, that is, that's that's 90% of it. After that, you should be able to talk about whatever you like, and people should be able to hear you just fine. So with that, let's uh, get Chris Curran's advice, because you're the one who doles out this advice. Talk to us uh, what you tell budding podcasters about audio production and, and the tools that they that they need, and, and, and then how to use them. Yeah, I like what you said, Chris, and very true. Those two things are very, very important. Uh, another important thing is that I think the average person doesn't um, that doesn't understand that they, they don't hear the noises around them very much because they're not paying attention, like just regular life noises. For instance, someone might start a podcast and you tell them about mic technique and you tell and they have they can hear themselves OK in, in, in their ears. But then, you know, they're sipping a drink and they put the drink down or then they're tapping their foot or, you know, there's a fan on three feet away from them. You know, I always have to tell people that you really have to like you're not in your office anymore. You're in a recording studio or wherever mm. you are. You're in a recording studio. So you got to be quiet and even even breathing as well. Like like people oh my you know oh, again yeah. that's kind of mic technique but it's kind of the same thing like you have to be aware of what noises are happening and don't make any extra noises <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's so true, true. yeah I, you know what reminded me of this just the other day i was listening to i think i was listening to the radio and they there was a guest no i was listening to, i was listening it was, it was a podcast i was listening to a, uh, a podcast and they had a guest and the guest was on the phone on a regular, you know, it sounded like a like a uh, a good old Western electric telephone, and the ge the guest on the phone, they would say something, and then they would, then they would go, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yes, I hear that often. You know, I, I Chris Curran, if you've got a guest who is a, a, a mouth breather or even a, a nose breather, I mean, if they're just breathing into the yeah. phone while you're trying to answer their question or respond to what they said. Is there anything you can do about that other than fade them down on a fader? Hopefully they're on their own fader. Yeah, not really. I mean, the, the phone itself is is interesting because it's hard to tell people how to talk into a phone. I mean, everyone thinks they can do it. Although I swear I've had guests <laughs> on shows where they're talking into the phone. And you know how like sometimes when you're talking into an actual phone, you'll kind of like turn your head and put your Wander mouth away off. from the phone? <laughs> And you can hear them drift off the phone, and I'm. It's like, do I really have to tell you to talk into the phone? <laughs> so that's weird. But yeah, if, if someone's a really heavy breather in a phone, then yeah, I just it takes a lot in post production to go through and because you can't put a gate on it, and it you know even the, right. there's a deep breath 
um, module in RX6, which is one of the soft main software that I use to fix bad audio. There's a deep breath module, but still, if it's someone on a phone, it's hard for the software to 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 know if that's a breath, and it's it's it, it's just tough. It just takes time in post production. What what what's one of the kills me is I've I've got a, a friend, wonderful guy, love the guy, but when I I hate talk to him on the phone because on the phone he he always he always. <laughs> Tucks the phone under his triple chin, the, the, the bottom, the bottom of it here, you know, he's a little heavy and it's just, yeah, you know, yeah. his, his, his DNA is such that most of his weight comes in the form of, of extra chins and you can't, it's out. So, dude, um, can, can you hold the phone up near your mouth again? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was. <laughs> no, yeah. it was under it was under your chins, and oh yeah. So the, the remote guest, you can't even give them a visual cue, right? Uh, like in the studio, you can you can kind of look at someone and go, you know, while they're yeah, talking, yeah. you point can at the mic, yep. at the mic, right? You point at the mic. <laughs> oh, yeah, gosh. guest having guests on podcast is the most frustrating and and tedious part of podcast production first of all you got the internet connection speed then you got yeah. the way that they're connecting whether it's by phone or, or whatever then you have the microphone they're using whether it's earbuds or an actual headset by the way everyone when when they, when anyone says headset nowadays they probably mean earbuds uh, and i yeah. i consider a headset a headset with a little arm coming off the side in front of my mouth Everyone says, oh, no, I'm wearing a headset. And I, every time I say, <laughs> you mean earbuds? And they say, yeah, earbuds. And I go, okay. So, and then, you know, with the earbuds, it's got the microphone on here and it, it like flaps around and it's like, you got to have people hold that wire the whole time. I actually have them hold the wire still the entire time. So that mic doesn't flap around. And, but even then, one of the things that goes wrong is they'll, you know, like the, like, you could see the the microphone is on the right side of my the right side here. Yeah. They'll turn their head all the way to the left, and then they'll start talking <laughs> like this, and it just sounds like they're way <laughs> off mic, and it's like, oh, you can't win. Oh, oh, gee, you, you know, actually, that's a um, a, a good point in that when, when I'm doing TV weather, um, the 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 side of the green screen that I stand on and look at the camera is different at the TV station I'm at now versus the the other one. I used to always put the, the the lapel mic on my left lapel. And the place I'm doing weekend weather at now, uh, that I'd be away from the mic all the time looking at the camera. So now I have to put the, the belt pack on the right side of my body and, and the mic on the right lapel. So I'm always, my voice is crossing over the microphone when I'm, you know, my, I'm, my head is turned to look at, at the camera. And it makes a difference. So that's yeah, I, I I can see how that would be a a problem with with guests. Wow. Hey, uh, um, well, we're gonna get to this thing about plugins a little bit later on because plugins is is an area of engine of of um, technical expertise that a lot of I think broadcast engineers probably don't have. I certainly don't. So I want to hear about how you use those. But let's talk about two things, uh, Chris, that that you mentioned uh, the other day to me, and and those I I, I love the, the 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 alliteration here: mixing and fixing, mixing and fixing. <laughs> How, how do you cover these two subjects with people who are in your, your school? Well, let's start with fixing. Um, one of the good things about podcasting is that usually it's not broadcast live as it's being recorded. Sometimes it is. But even if it is, you still have time later to sit down and do post-production. So you mm -hmm. have time to go through the tracks. And what I do when I produce podcasts is every single track, and of course I try to record, always try to record each person on their own track because oh, then I can oh. manipulate it later. That's pretty talk, obvious. Talk to, me, talk to me about that. Now, you know, this show that we do, we've done the show live for years and we don't record people on their own tracks. But when um, I was associated with a, a different podcast network, the, the twit.tv network, uh, they wanted to record every source on its own track so they could go fix things in post. And I, as a broadcast engineer, I thought that was pretty unusual because usually in broadcast, we deal with mono or stereo and rarely individual tracks unless, you know, you're the imaging guy at the radio station. So yeah. talk to me about, uh, you know, how would people normally do that? How would you accomplish recording each participant in a podcast on their own track? 
Yeah, so I have a whole studio here in my basement where I have a mixer. And of course, the mixer is the center of my studio, which is it's the center of every studio, basically. And then I have four different laptops set up. And I literally have an audio interface for each laptop. And then I bring in one person on each laptop. And then I run it through my mixer. And then I can run it out of my mixer and record each track separately. Mm. And also, at the same time, I can run each... Uh, run a mix minus to each participant as well so they don't get feedback and all that. Uh, so that's one way to do it. But again, then you need a bunch of computers and a and a good mixer with at least four aux ends for the mix minuses. Not everyone can do that. That's why now there are services like Zencaster and Ringer, which it's almost like uh, it's almost like a Skype group call, mm -hmm. but it actually records each participant in the background, without them knowing it, it records each participant on their local computer. And then, as, as, the, as the episode is going, it'll, in the background, it'll slowly upload that audio. So that local recording of each participant is, is crucial because it's not going yeah. through the internet. So there's no glitching, there's, no, there's none of that crap. It's just everyone's local track, and then at the end, you end up with everyone's local track, and it's really helpful. Now, in in the two person form of this interviewer interviewee, I think the technique you just described is called a double ender. Um, and uh, Chris Tobin, you have worked for networks that did double ender recording. Can you describe what that is, and then we'll let Chris talk about it in the multiple person? Because I'm curious about in broadcast, we typically don't do that, but I, I think you have some experience in that, Tobin. Well, in, in the in the news coverage I've done, we've we usually track two separate. Anyway, it's two separate tracks on the camera. When we've done uh, audio recordings, it was always two separate tracks, so we could manipulate and post. Um, there's various techniques that people use, and it's changed a lot these days. Uh, matter of fact, in the work that I'm doing here with the music, we will. Uh, we just did a, a conference the other night with panelists of uh, four people, and each one had a track on the little Tascam box. We have a Tascam D70, I think it's called, and it lets you track literally record four separate tracks onto it. SD card so we could work with it in post. Um, there's different names for it, different techniques and, um, and what Chris is pointing out is very handy. It's, it's actually probably the best thing you could be doing. In broadcast, single tracking was done a lot in certain places but not everywhere. I know stereo mono is what everybody's familiar with but I know I worked on a few radio stations when we did uh, artist interviews. We always tracked the artist and the jock on separate tracks and then did the music. Um, I know it wasn't very popular but that, that was around for a while. You know, and, and the first time I heard Double Ender was in relation to NPR, that they would do interviews. A lot of times NPR would do interviews with people in either in New York City or in Washington, D.C., just a, a lot of the people they talked to on on their you know, morning edition. Or, or, you know, or, yeah. And, and, and back then, though, they would send a courier with a cassette recorder out yep. to the, you know, out to the senator's office, right? And so they would record, I mean, they, they would, the, the reporter from NPR and the senator, let's say, would talk on the phone. And of course, it was easy to record the reporter at NPR. They were right there in the studio. But the guy, the courier on the bicycle would have a, uh, would have this cassette recorder and would be holding it up near the senator while the senator was on the phone. Then the dude would run that cassette tape back to NPR and where they would dub it over to multi-track reel and they would, you know, line those up and then they would, you know, all you know, they wouldn't but, use the phone audio. The phone audio was there, just yeah. was kind of like metadata at that point, right? That's what, so that's anyway. what they call tape sync. That's that. That's the tape, oh, tape sync. sync. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. double ender was used for a long time, and then it's, something changed, and now it's known as tape sync. I, I do. We do that a lot here. I've did. I just uh, two weeks ago did it for the BBC for three different documentaries where they had the guests for the documentary here in our studios. The BBC correspondent was on the phone, and they were talking, chatting. I recorded the studio audio and heads and tails and put it on an FTP site and off they got it that afternoon and next morning they were up and running on the BBC Radio 1 or Radio 2 and they were having huh. their thing. So yeah, it's, it's known as tape sync and yes, NPR does it a lot. Um, as a okay, matter so of fact, a lot of news agencies do it. That would pretty well confuse me. So tell you what, let's let's look at Chris Curran. Why don't you talk about this technique for getting a podcast produced with the highest possible quality. Uh, if anything goes wrong with the IP connection, you've got this um, locally recorded version 
that gets sent automatically in the background as a file rather than as live audio. Is, is, have I got that concept right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. So just to back up to the double ender, the way double enders are usually done in podcasting is the host, it's obviously their show. They will obviously, they're recording themselves and, and recording the guest over the VoIP signal or the phone. But then mm -hmm. the guest, if they're technically savvy enough, they can open up, you know, a program like Audacity or Reaper or Audio Hijack, and they can record themselves locally in high mm -hmm. resolution. And then they record themselves locally. And when they're done, they hit stop and then they save that file and then they Dropbox that file to the host. And then later on, the host lines it up. That's a traditional double ender. The problem in podcasting is most guests are they're either not technically savvy enough to to run a software and then Dropbox a file, or they just don't have time, or they don't care, or all three. You know, it's like you're trying to get a CEO to be your guest on your podcast, and right. the guy has a you know 60 minute window or a 30 minute window, and you just got to connect with him and hit record and do the interview. There's no way you're gonna have him download software, record something, <laughs> Dropbox it. You just can't do that. So yeah. that's why these Zencaster and Ringer are popular now because you can you can just connect with them almost like you're connecting over Skype but in the background they're being recorded uh and I will say that Zencaster and Ringer are not perfect they and, and and I to this day I can't understand why there hasn't been a company to figure out how to do this really well and really seamlessly and but I think in the end what it comes down to is people's computers so you can have the best software ever, but if someone has the worst computer that's that's running, you know, that has 97 windows open and 47 <laughs> browsers open, I mean, yes. it ain't going to, sorry, it's just not going to work, you know. I, I guess the easy solution to that, and it, hey, hey, on this podcast, when we have guests, uh, some are more technically savvy than others. Chris, Curran, I, I, I hope that you'd be pretty easy to deal with because you do this for a living. Uh but you know, we have people. We have to tell them, uh, "Hey, have a mic somewhere, cl somewhere close to your mouth, okay?" Um, <laughs> and and uh, and that's how I say, it, you know, a, a boom, you know, a boom is great, you know, here, like, you know, like something like this uh, on a headset that that would be okay. Um, but get them to reboot their computer, you know, an hour before the show starts. So if there's any Windows updates, that maybe we can take care of that in an, inside of an hour. Um, and, and don't open a bunch of other stuff, just reboot and, you know, open your Skype and then we'll do the show that, that that's helped a little bit when they follow that, that direction. Yeah, it does help when they follow the directions. And, and so fixing bad audio is the first thing I do. So when I get the tracks or I record a guest or anything, um, first I'll open it up in some software and I'll look at it and I'll, you know, sometimes there's a hum, sometimes there's a lot of like background noise, like a fan running or a, you know, something like that. Oh, so yeah. I'll sometimes do noise reduction and get rid of any hums. And a lot of times I'll take out some of the low end, you know, um, the really low sure. end, like literally 20 Hertz and below. Sometimes there's all kinds of data there, which you don't need cause you can't even hear it. And, um, and it affects the level of the audio cause it, you know, the, the low end carries more energy than high frequencies. So I'll just clean it up the best I can. Uh, and so, and then I bring everything into my multi-track DAW and that's where I do my mixing. And the mixing is, again, I come from the music industry, so I'm used to mixing songs. So literally mm. I, I mix podcast episodes as if it's a song. I have the music on a track. I have each person on their own track and I'll add yeah. EQ and compression and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll really massage it so the levels are good, the music's good, fade things. Uh, mixing is the thing in podcasting that separates the, uh, the adults from the children, so to say. Um, mm. and it is an art. It really is. Hey, uh, if you just tuned in, we are uh, talking with uh, Chris Curran, Chris of Fractal Recording and also Podcast Engineering School. We'll give you the uh, the 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 uh, URLs for those uh, as we move along here. Uh, Chris Tobin is along as well, and you're listening or, or watching this week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. It's our 375th episode. We're getting uh, advice from Chris Curran about podcasting and about how to do basic recording and mixing and, and problem fixing. And coming up, we're going to talk about plugins for digital audio workstations to understand what those do. And and I'm I'm kind of a newbie to that. I'd like to understand that better. So that's coming up. Also. At the same time, we have going on here 
Uh, <laughs> some time ago, like three weeks ago, I promised we'd give away uh, an Amazon Echo Dot, and uh, I had did. I was very dilatory in following up on that. The 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 way the what we said on the show, we were talking about smart speakers like the Echo Dot, and um, some engineers have um, uh, either you know hacked or you might say hacked written software, written an interface for Wemo to when you say something to the Echo Dot or or the full Echo or whatever. Uh, it'll it'll do something with the Wemo. It'll give you contact closure. You can look at data coming in, or you know, a voltage level or a closure coming in. Point is, you can start to have it do you know kind of smart things around the radio station. Instead of a smart home, you got a smart station. Well, we uh, solicited your ideas on our Facebook page uh, about this, and so there's actually there's several different places on Facebook that I'm monitoring right now to uh, to see your replies. We're getting a lot of great replies. John Hess, Ma uh, Mark uh, Binder. Uh, Bob Holowenko, Tim Ingram have all made good replies. Uh, Jim Armstrong, Eric Boyer, uh, Eric, uh, yeah, Eric Boyer and others. Anyway, it's not too late. Uh, get on our Facebook page, This Week in Radio Tech, uh, or the Broadcasting Club. There's a post about this as well. And if you got a great idea of what you would control around a radio station with an Echo Dot or any smart speaker, um, we'll take it down. We'll have a little, um, make a quick decision at the end of the show. And I'm going to give away not one, but two of them, Okay. They might even be linked to my Amazon account. God, I hope not. <laughs> but they could be. <laughs> <laughs> to put oh, a boy. stop on my Amazon account right away. People start uh, buying right. things with the Echo Dots. They'll be charged <laughs> to your account. <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's what I'm afraid could happen. So anyway, I, I, hopefully they're not. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll check Alexa, that out. Alexa, buy me a new Sennheiser MKH 416. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and Kirk gets the bill. Oh, right. gosh. <laughs> Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at uh, BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide at bswusa.com. It's, uh, it's the Christmas for the caster. Oh, this is a timely, isn't it? You can save up to 61%, whether you're a broadcaster, a podcaster, voice caster, or everything caster. You can take advantage of the lowest prices of the year on a wide range of gear. Now, look, uh, the folks at BSW, these guys are experts at they make great deals when they get broadcasting gear, the gear that you want, and they can pass those savings on to you. I know you've heard that phrase a million times before, but that's exactly what they do. That is their, that's their game, if you will. And you know that they print fantastic catalogs and their online presence is also terrific. I mean, it's a reference for most people. So if you just go to the website, bswusa.com, bookmark that, or memorize it, and uh, you can quickly go get yourself reference prices on things and see what your discounts are from BSW for all the great things that they offer discounts on, which is just about everything. Uh, right now, for example, during this Christmas for the caster sale, you can get broadcast mics, um, the MXL BCD-1. It's a dynamic mic, delivers a warm, rich sound. It has a built-in 12-foot XLR cable. Uh, it's only $159 for a limited time, this mic from MXL. That's 54% uh, off. You can save $91 on Henry Engineering's Super Relay 2 control interface. Hey, maybe you've got uh, a, a small audio console that's not really meant for broadcast, but you want to trigger a, a tally light outside your studio. Uh, you can do that. Uh, the Super Relay 2 has a built-in interface that makes it absolutely safe and foolproof to interface a simple switch to you know, 110 volt uh, uh, relay output, so it'll it'll give you that voltage. It'll even flash that light if you choose the flashing light, and give you other contact closures as well. So you can, I think, turn one closure input into six output closures. Uh, we use them at our radio stations. Uh, the ultimate headset, you can get three Audio Technica BPHS1 headsets for the price of two. So you buy two, and you say, "Send me that third one free," and they will. It has a uh, cool. focus to, yeah, yeah, it really is. And, and you know what, if you ever bought a headset and it came with a bare cable at the end of it, and you're trying to solder a DIN connector or whatever you might need onto it. Well, these come with pre-installed XLR and quarter inch connectors. So even I could just plug them right in to my little on the road Behringer console and uh, bam, there you go. And we've used it several times for doing this show. Finally, I want to uh, mention uh, the, uh, my favorite mic processor for a single mic and that is it's inexpensive and it's very effective and it's the dbx 286s hey if my camera cable was long enough i'd i'd 
point it down here under under the table and show you mine. Uh, it's a it's a just a great voice processor. It does basic stuff and it does it very well. And I love the downward expansion. That's what I really like because it gets rid of room noise. If you've got a little bit of background noise, it just if you shut up, it shuts up. And it's thirty dollars instant rebate on this DBX two eighty six S mic processor uh, with this real studio quality uh, mic instrument preamp. Four processors inside. They do different things. And, uh, of course, there's EQ, there's DSing, there's compression, and there's downward expansion. And uh, it's, it's it, I mean, for, gee, for the price, it's just awesome. Uh, they offer free same-day shipping for that, too. Free? What? I just now saw that. Free same-day shipping. Actually, that's on all the items I've just mentioned um, and, and more. So check it out. Uh, the link is on the show notes. But just go to bswusa.com and uh, enjoy the savings. We appreciate their sponsorship of uh, This Week in, in Radio Tech. All right, let's see. Chris Tobin, are you still hey, with us? Hey, by the way, yeah. I have a good friend who uses those Audio Technica BPHS one, the headsets with the mic. Um, he he uses them when he does podcasting on location. So he'll show ah. up somewhere, and him and his wife will wear them, and they'll hand one to the guest, and the guest will put it on, and they just you know they don't have to have mic stands and everything. They just they just roll with that, and it works really well for them. It does work well, and guess what? The mic stays in the right place. <laughs> so that, <that's> right. <laughs> you can you can move around, and the mic just stays right there. You know, uh, yeah. The thing with the headsets with the little boom arms uh -huh. that come off. What mm -hmm. in my experience, sometimes if if you put it in the wrong spot, you'll hear a lot of breathing. But oh, yeah. sometimes yeah. if you tell them to point it down a little more, or even point yeah. it like have it up a little more, it it gets out of the way of that the the nostril breath, and then you don't hear the nostrils. Uh, you don't hear the breathing. So that's important to get it in the right spot first. And then, then it's always in the right spot. Yeah. And, and those mics are very focused. You know, their, their, uh, uh, ad copy didn't say noise canceling, but I, I think they are in that they have a rear vent so that any noise that is common to the area doesn't really get picked up by the mic, but any noise, anything that's coming in just on one side, like, um, your voice, uh, <laughs> that, that is what you hear. And so that, yeah, that yeah. works. It's works actually really a cardioid. Well capsule on the end of those so it is directional right to your mouth so Pretty let's cool. uh chris tobin um uh at the you've worked at a different type of radio station than, than i typically have and maybe the place you're at now does a bit more of this but uh chris what, what what's your experience with plugins for digital audio workstations because I, ha I have none zero oh our our production facilities are two of our three of our studios we use plugins and Pro Tools uh, all the time. And if, in fact, when we've done uh, recordings for music with the musicians, on uh, many occasions we're using plugins for, uh, you know, not noise canceling. Yeah, maybe some noise canceling and from compression, EQ, and various other things. Yeah, that's it's quite common. Okay. So, me, no experience. Chris has experience. Chris Curran is going to tell us about using plugins and, and kind of what they do. I, I guess there's a common API or language that these plugins speak when you plug them into. The, uh, audio workstations. Well, yeah, it, is there a lot? there's a lot of plugins. There's, there's several brands, several product lines. A lot of them have uh, hooks into standard, say Audacity or Pro Tools or Audition, Adobe Audition. Uh, there, there's there's a lot out there. It's it's kind of crazy, but yeah, depending on what your needs are, you can and you can get just as dangerous with plugins as you would with the hardware version <laughs> of them. I'm sure. <laughs> Over oh, easy to overuse. Chris Kern, what what what's your teaching about this? Yeah, some people get addicted to alcohol. Some people get addicted to cocaine. Some people get addicted to buying plugins. I swear to God. I think my students, uh, the alumni of my school, are trying to stage an intervention for me. Um, no, so so plugins are are you know in the old studio when you're you're you have a big mixing console and you're mixing a record and you want to put an EQ on someone's voice, you 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 put there's a whole rack behind you of EQs and compressors and everything. It's physical gear. It's like audio processing gear. And so you can run the vocal through the EQ and you turn around and you mess with the EQ and you make it sound good. And then, and then of course, you add compressors and you add a bunch of stuff to all the instruments and everything. That's called mixing a record. And that's what plugins are in a computer. It's literally like plugging in one of these EQs from the rack, but it's all virtual. It's all in the box. And it's awesome. And one of the great things that they've done, and they've gotten really good at this in the, in the last few years, plugins have been around for a long time. I mean, at least, oh, God, probably 15, no, 20 years, 25 years or more. 
I don't really know. Long time. Uh, and recently, they've gotten a lot better at modeling classic gear. So if you want, you know, an LA 2A compressor, which is like one of the best compressors known in music production, there's a plugin now that does that exact thing. And they have modeled the plugin off of the physical piece of gear. So it actually sounds a lot like the physical piece of gear. And that's awesome, which means now you can have your software, you can have your multi track DAW, and you just can just get some good plugins. And all of a sudden, you transform this, you know, plain vanilla DAW into an awesome, you know, mixing tool. And so plugins are, are just great. And you can, you can chain them together. I have, I have a standard plugin chain, it's probably 15 plugins. And I don't always use all 15. Usually I use, three or four or five. Uh, but I, but <laughs> I always apply 15 and then I just turn them on as I need them at, to what I, what I think it should sound like. So, so awesome. in day to day use, what, what's your, what's your top three plugins? What, what are your go-tos that, that, I, you know what? I, I, I need to fix, I know I need to fix this or this is such a typical problem. I'll fix it with this plugin. And then do you have a plugin that kind of like finalizes stuff? You just apply to everything cause you like the, what it does. Yeah. So in that, sense and i'm actually pulling up my uh my plugins here my list of plugins so to start real quick with the finalizing thing you just mentioned yes mm -hmm. i have a plugin uh it's like well it's a plugin but it's it's also standalone software it's from isotope it's called ozone 8 and it's mastering software so it's you know in broadcasting you guys know you have the limiters and the compressors and you just you you smash the audio and then, then it goes out the door. In music, it, anytime you mix a record, it goes to a mastering engineer, and he finalizes it, or she puts the fi finishing touches on it, compresses it, makes it louder, and then, then it goes out the door. With podcasting, most podcasters don't use a mastering step, and that's really, really bad because, you know, if you've ever been in a car, I remember once I went to uh, Vegas for a conference. I think it was the, um, I can't remember which conference. Anyway. I drove and I drove through Utah and in Utah, mm -hmm. the speed limit, I think is 85 in some place. I'm going down the highway, 85 miles an hour. I'm trying to listen to podcasts and the dynamic range is so much that when the host gets loud, it hurts my ears and I'm like, oh, I'll turn it down. And then of course, when the host starts, you know, they start just mumbling. It, it goes down below the noise floor. I can't hear it anymore. So I'm sitting there riding the volume and that's the number one thing that, that, makes uh, that frustrates listeners of podcasts is that it it the dynamic range is too much and why because the people producing them they don't know better so you can actually in your daw on the master bus you can put a mastering software and do some compression some limiting some eq some ex ex use an exciter there's all kinds of stuff you can do uh, and that finalizes it and glues it together and makes it louder with a little less dynamic range uh, but it still still has life. It just it it's not going to dip way below that noise floor. It's because it's not only driving in a car. It's you're on a you're jogging on a treadmill. That the treadmill's yeah. loud, right? A lot of these things are loud. Um, so I'm looking at my single plugins here. Um, I use an SSL channel strip, which is cool. Oh. It's uh, and a lot of a lot of the plugins I use are from Waves, and they're VST plugins. That's one of the uh, types of plugins. And VST plugins are very common. They'll work in pretty much any DAW, except VST plugins. And SSL channel so that, strip is from those old SSL consoles. Yep. Ah, so, so, so v VST is a standard. And, and if your DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, supports VST plugins, then you can buy a VST plugin and and be assured it's going to work. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And there's okay. there's several standards. I mean, maybe probably at least four or five or six different standards. Like I know Pro Tools uses AAX. Uh, and I don't think AAX work anywhere else but Pro Tools. I'm not sure. Ah. But VST is like the most widely used. So it's very safe to buy VST plugins. Um, okay. I have an API EQ, which is, again, a classic EQ. I use, um, you know, an old uh, a knockoff of a Neve 1073, a knockoff of the Pultec EQs. Uh, there's a company called Fab Filter, which makes really awesome plugins. They have a DSer, which I love, and they also have an EQ plugin, which I really love. It's awesome because you could see 
it, it gives you a graph of the frequencies and you literally see where the problem frequencies are. And then you can, it's uh-huh. so fine tuned adjustments you can make. Um, I have uh, compressors. I have a knockoff of an old 1176 and also a knockoff of an LA-2A. And I have an Aphex Vintage Oral Exciter, which is which is cool, which is also similar to the high frequency detail in that that channel strip you mentioned, the DBX two eighty six S. That that's it's they're trying to be like the Aphex Oral Exciter, and it, and it's pretty good. Uh, and then I have hey, something uh, called uh, a Vocal Rider. Yeah, that's the last the one of my rider. chain is a Vocal Rider, and what it does right. is it's like you set the the range on a fader, and you set the target loudness. And the fader will actually, like if, if the sound is too low, the fader will push it up a little. And if the sound is too loud, the fader will pull it down a little. It's almost like a little engineer in the computer riding the <laughs> fader to make sure that the level yeah. stays stays good. It's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, and, you know, so much of what you're describing here is stuff that I guess I'm familiar with, Chris Tobin's familiar with, because in broadcast audio processing, we do a lot of this automatically and and have for decades and done it in a way that is uh, obviously real time and uh, used to be hardware based, now largely DSP based, uh, or even software that's emulating DSP. So yeah, I I, I get this, and um, uh, it's yeah, it's it's interesting. But it, I, I do think it's interesting. All the thing, the other things you can fix with plugins. Sure, there's compression. There's probably multi band compression. I I've been using. A, uh, Adobe Audition. Oh, yeah. If I want to multiband compress my voice, I I can. It's a little much, but yeah, I certainly can. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's let's hit one more quick subject before we take our last break. And by the way, after the break is when we will be giving away these, and we're gonna have to leave a few extra minutes of time to to go over the um uh the the entries, the ideas, if you will. People have been uh, been posting those on uh, on several different places on on Facebook. Uh, and that is LUFs, loudness units, full scale. Chris, if you could give us just give me a little elevator speech, give me a quick understanding of what are LUFs and why are they important to me? Yeah, so LUFs is the the newer loudness standard. It's actually, you know, it's not exactly new, but it's been around for maybe five or eight years or something. But over the last three years or so, it's really been implemented. Uh, actually, it's probably been around longer than that. So what it does is it's it's a loudness standard because the problem they had with TV was that the TV show would be at one level and then the commercial would come on and it would blow your top of your head off. And they wanted to standardize things. So everything was the same level. And so, again, for listener experience. So what they've done is, you know, Europe has their own loudness standards. America has their own for TV and radio, and then there's a podcasting standard as well, and it's just really helpful to to have a loudness goal, and so that you know your podcast is loud enough, so when people click on an app and they listen, that it, it's loud enough, and and not more or less than other shows as well. Gotcha. So it's roughly in with other shows. So if I am using my uh, my phone or my iPod to uh, to listen to some shows, uh, I if if people are following a left standard, I can be fairly well assured that. From one show to the next, the volume is going to be reasonably consistent. I, I won't get blown out by one and have to crank it way up for another. Yeah. Yeah. And then even during the show itself, um, if you're using a, well, of course, if you're using good metering technique with almost any ballistic of meter, VU or PPM or Nordic style, uh, all different kinds of uh, meters. If you're using good technique, you're, you're going you're gonna to be okay anyway. But having that LUF standard that really does measure loudness the way your ear perceives it, that's a real good tool to have. And you can measure LUFs, by the way, in a in a short integration, you know, of, of, of I don't know if it's a second or less, a medium integration of a few seconds or a long integration of, say, a whole show length. Uh, it's helpful to see these different integration times uh, so you can tell, um, uh, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really loud right now, but, uh, but uh, overall, I'm still okay. Anyway, it's a, yeah, it, exactly. we can consume a, a whole little, show with this topic. Yeah, it's kind of tricky how, how to uh, evaluate a whole podcast episode, let's say, and, and, and mm-hmm. give an average loudness of it. And there are different meters. There are software that could set the level um, exactly. And um, it, it's just really helpful. Um, and and easy to set it to the standard once you know what it is. So ah okay, and so I guess there are plugins that actually would take a finished program and 
adjusted so that it it worked out well for loudness units. That's it. The last step you do, I use Isotope RX six to do that. Mm -hmm. I say put okay. if it's a stereo episode, put it at minus sixteen luffs and the peak at minus one or minus one point five, and boom, mm -hmm. it'll process it and do that. Also, there's Auphonic, which is a website which a lot of podcasters use to upload their audio to level it at the very end to to the luffs level. Okay. Cool. Hey, uh, Chris Tobin is here, and uh, we're talking with Chris Curran of uh, the Podcast Engineering School. And uh, tell you what, we're going to take our last break. When we come back, we're going to do several things. Chris Curran has a, uh, a tip for us. Uh, Chris Tobin has a tip for us, and I have a giveaway to do. So stay tuned for all that. Speaking of luffs and loudness and metering and, all, and, and that kind of thing, it's all built in to the Lavo radio console line. Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com uh, slash twerk. If you use that, that if you go there, first of all, they know that you came there because you heard it here. And that, that'd be really nice if you would do that if you're checking out Lavo consoles. But also when you go to Lavo dot com, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk, you will be presented with their radio products. And here is the newest radio product they have. It is the Ruby console. This console is absolutely amazing. It's first of all, it's gorgeous. I mean, it, you know, it, it's there. It, this is their standard hardware layout that's been developed over years. People love this this design. Easy to use. Easy to see everything. But then the visual display that 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 goes with it that can really get you under the hood. That can let you see loudness levels, clocks. It can let you see pre-fader levels and post-fader levels. It can also uh, help you create a good mix. It's also where you would turn on the auto mix feature. Let's say, for example, that you know, you're know you doing a talk show, you're doing a sports talk show, and you've got people who are seasoned broadcasters, and then you've got a guest who's eh, not so much. Auto mix will really help you out. It'll keep people's levels where they ought to be and uh, looking good. Oh, there's there's a good, uh, uh, good look at, at this. You can also uh, bring in other... Uh, you know, live streams. You can you can bring in other elements onto the screen. Uh, for example, traffic <laughs> traffic cams as shown in, in the example right here. Uh, the latest news headlines. Uh, just lots of things you can do. You can program this screen to do. I wish I could tell you all of them. It's just, it's so much. It's almost the case if you can think of it. If it's available on your network or outside from the internet, you can put it on the screen and give your board operator your talent. Uh, truly the information that they need to, to have to put together the best possible show. Uh, I mentioned the auto mix. That's very cool because uh, you, you, you can hands off. You know, you can set those levels on the console and be assured that when you come back in six or seven minute, minutes, the show will be, be has been mixed perfectly the whole time you were gone. Uh, you can even give preference to the host. If you need the host to be able to talk talk down everybody else, no problem. You can do that, too. Uh, there's also an auto level set. So if you have uh, somebody that's never been in the studio before, you have no idea if they talk loud or talk soft, uh, just catch their audio in the first few seconds and set the, the auto set button and bam. Now you have actually set their level for the input of the mic preamp so that you're not you're not you're not close to blowing the mic preamp out or you're not uh, getting too much noise because you're way down in the mud with it. You're at just the ideal level there. Um, so this this console, this Ruby console, they're so proud of this as they really should be. So uh, check this thing out. Oh, but it, you know, it, it does Ravenna. It does AES67, so it's networked with audio over IP, uh, standards-based audio over IP with uh, AES67. So it, it's worth your checking out. That's lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerked in the new Ruby console. Okay, we're about to finish up our show, but we have a couple things to do. Uh, Chris Curran. Can you provide us with a tip that you'd love for our listeners to walk away with? Yeah. So when you're manipulating audio and trying to get audio to sound good, the main thing that you need to make sure of is you need to know what you're hearing. So mm. you just can't play audio through any speaker and know what it sounds like. Maybe the speaker is really bassy or maybe you're wearing earbuds or headphones that are really trebly, have a lot of high mm -hmm. end. How can you mix or process audio when you, you're not even hearing a balanced level? So they do make certain software, and I use one called Sonarworks, which can actually, um, you can actually almost, you can tune your speakers in your studio, and you can even tune your headphones. Like I have headphones that are, that are 
it runs through an EQ pattern that flattens them out flat. So they're not emphasizing any frequency over another. So I know what I'm hearing is absolutely flat and that way I can mix. And then when you get used to that, that's how you get good at mixing and processing audio. And then you know when it goes out the door that it is right. So they do make software. Uh, Sonarworks is one. There's also another big brand, but there's a few. But very handy to tune your speakers and headphones. That's a great uh, a great point. And uh, for several years, I used um, some Samsung uh, Android phones. And and uh, the latest version that I had, uh, I, get, I think this was a Samsung add-on, but it lets you calibrate your earbuds, your earphones. And it did it did it by playing you a series of tones to see can I hear it or not? Is it you know at the threshold I can hear it or not? And uh, I, there were some other parts of the test too. And based on my answers to the questions, it would come up with an EQ curve for each left and right side. And I sure noticed that you know it sounds better this way. It it feels like I feel like I'm getting a a pretty flat response. I'm guessing that the thing from Sonarworks and and others are probably even more sophisticated than than what was just built into the Samsung phone. Yeah, and I even um, actually ordered a pair of headphones from Sonarworks, and they literally <laughs> calibrated that exact pair of headphones in their uh, shop, and then mailed them to me, and then emailed me the little uh, the EQ profile. So that's what EQ profile mm -hmm. I run on my computer when I have the headphones on. Pretty cool. 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 Hey, Chris Tobin, you have a quick tip for us before we get to our winners. Sure, sure. Quick tip is since we're talking podcast studio design. Whoops, let me get back in frame um i would suggest and i run into this on several occasions with people calling me up for help for podcasting label the cables okay i know that sounds crazy but i cannot tell you how many times in just this week i was in a, at a location in the evening somebody asked for help they had a nice mackie mixer they had all these cables plugged in everything running underneath the furniture and out into their little studio they built and then when it came time to figure out what was what we spent probably 40 minutes trying to figure out which cable was to the microphone, which cable went to the camera, which cable went to the headphone amplifier they had, and they had a series of little gadgets doing other things. So take the time to label the cables, whether it's with a number or a little Sharpie. You can get these uh, label stickers that you can stick on there and label them. Do it. It's well worth it. Cool. You and your labels. And your kid, uh, you're going you're gonna to hit that until I, until I finally start labeling my cables, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. All right. But it's good advice. I know it is. I know it is. Um, oh, come right. on. Chris hey, has definitely got to come across people that haven't had the cables label, and he's sitting there trying to figure out what's it plugged into. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I got to run through these quickly. <clears throat> I'm going to run through these ideas. I'm not going to mention who's, who uh, brought them up, but these are ideas for what you can use a smart speaker for in your radio station. What would you control with it? So both of you, listen up carefully. I'm going to buzz through these. You ready? Um, yep. Okay, gosh, I'm going to buzz through them. Some of these don't make any sense. Open mics, contact, <laughs> fire, if I had employees, oh, to fire employees, a contest for people to call you through the Echo, add skills so you can do a ton of stuff on air, intercom from one room to another. I like the intercom idea. Okay. All right, that's one idea. Another one is... I'd use it to watch the meter readings of the transmitter, monitor, and read them out to me if there was something outside of the threshold. The other thing would be have it dump the delay if someone messes up. Too bad it's not always listening, or else you could have it recognize certain colorful words and do that automatically. Well, that's true. Because, yeah, when you wake up uh, one of these devices, typically only listens for about eight seconds after that. Only eight seconds of audio gets passed on to their, uh, their computers. So there, there's an idea. Um, another gentleman says... Put tunes in the GM's office because I'm a good little brown noser. Okay, so <laughs> just put it in the GM's office. Um, someone says, use it to control Pathfinder. Now, that's Telos's, Axia's software to do route switching and things like that. So use it to command, to man, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, blah, blah, blah. Tell the transmitter to start playing Studio 3, you know, so you could do a switch that way. Uh, somebody says, turn on the coffee maker, of course. Somebody says, answer the phones. Oh, yeah, maybe you could, maybe you could just answer the phone with that. I don't know. If we, uh, somebody says, um, the weather guy and the pizza orders. I'm not sure what the weather guy refers to. Maybe you just ask him for what the weather is, but pizza orders. All right. Here's a voice control idea. This guy says, my company's creating a listener engagement platform integrating the, with wide orbit. We could have 
she who shall not be named, look at our database and find out what songs are coming up next on the station. From there, she would convey that information to the listener in either her voice or with a recording from on-air talent. If the listener likes or dislikes any of the songs, they could tell her, uh, and the data would be stored in our analysis, letting the station know that a real-time listener doesn't like what's about to play, allowing the station to make a correction, either manually or automatically based on PD rules. Okay? All right. Um, someone else says, uh, this idea is, is a replacement for a Q tone. For example, the latest news begins with a Q, and now for the latest news. This Q opens up the network or the recorder on the hard drive that is being keyed to present the news by speech recognition. At the end of the newscast, the news presenter says an ending Q that switches the network to local and speech recognition software. Also, Qs can insert spots and PSAs, which dumps the network spots and brings the local spot that covers local commercials. Okay. Wow. And there's another I more ideas. Uh, use voice synthesis. I always thought that it wouldn't it be great to have to look at a board that has a circuit on it of a transmitter, which every single component was under test and visible. Whereas the guy, okay, so you basically use it to do to do uh, troubleshooting where it might say capacitor one twenty three is going bad. That would be that would be cool. I don't I'm not don't know how this would do it, but maybe so. Um, the voice synthesized program reads who, what, when, and how. Say, Doctor Zutz, I'm not sure I understand this. How uh, the computer comes out with a copy that can be voice synthesized to spit out copy. The salesman sells the copy, stating the fact that the message is there without talent. Uh, okay, so basically, okay, so have it have it read copy and use that as your spec spot. I think that's what they, they're trying to say. And if they like the spec spot, then have it done by a real person. Um. Somebody else says we are we are actually are automating switching studios using Pathfinder PC, the Axia product. Being able to use voice would be really awesome. I can think of having it used to send messages to our main office to our DJs on the air. I've done a lot with automation, so putting an echo dot in the mix will definitely get me in the trouble with the other engineers. Okay, uh, one engineer says it would control a sledgehammer that hits the jocks when they talk too long. Okay, uh, somebody <laughs> says I'm controlling. I'm already controlling tons of stuff at the station. We are getting one of these in each studio, and he's showing the the uh, the one that's got the screen, the Amazon Echo Show. All right. Um, monitor and report the status of mission critical gear, such as transmitter, satellite feeds, and streams. All right. Announcements in the restrooms. So you put one of these in the restroom. Not sure how well that would go over, but you could have announcements in the restroom. Uh, somebody says provide reverb. Okay, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know how, I don't know how to do that. Think about that. Um, the page is displayed on the electronic billboard at the competing station. <laughs> you can control that every now and again, of <laughs> course, because I can. So have this put nefarious messages on your competitor's electronic billboard. Almost done here. Well, well we're almost done. Uh, a virtual assistant to help on-air talent walk through basic troubleshooting after hours. Well, that sounds useful. Um, somebody says, use it as a replacement for the Q-tones inside the computer, which is a slang word, a mechanical combo, whereas the presenter says a word and the device responds. Um, see if there's an example here. Um, set me up for the next hour of workflow, for example. Not sure what that means, but okay. Um, somebody says the coffee pot. It's a good idea. If she can just remember to also turn it off, <laughs> that would be great. Um, let's see. Ah, verbal commands that connect to virtual commands. So you're verbally telling something to happen, but we know that that's in the virtual world which eventually has to go touch something, you know, in, in the hardware world, probably. Um, and, oh, here's the, the last idea. Control our cameras. We stream to, uh, we, we live stream our shows on Twitch, Periscope, YouNow, uh, Ustream, and YouTube, and Facebook Live. If one device could control all the cameras, we'd be able to relieve several pieces of, of equipment. So, uh, like, like, a, like a director, would you say, uh, camera two, two shot. Camera one, over the shoulder shot. Camera one, pan left a little bit. Maybe he's talking about that. So you have a director to, to do that kind of stuff. All right, gentlemen, Chris and Chris, do any of these strike you as standing out as being like, yeah, that sounds like a candidate? Which one, uh, the number two on the list, was it? Number two from the top? Second one, third mm -hmm. one? What was that again? Uh, well, the, the second one was um, uh, I'd watch meter readings, transmitter, monitor them, read out, read out them out to me if something was outside the threshold. Uh, also, have it dump the delay if someone messes up. Too bad it's not always listening, or you could have someone recognize certain colorful words and dump automatically. 
Right, right. Now there was, was another one after that, maybe. Uh, the, 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 okay. well, uh, use it to control the Pathfinder. intercom one. Use it as an intercom. Oh, the intercom uh, one. That's what I thought was the intercom one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, let you. me uh, let me real quick search for uh, search for that one. I, I, mm -hmm. This this has been several pages worth. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, the intercom one. Yeah, all the dots around the facility. That'd be cool. Uh, of course, I can't find my search function. I'm going to vote for the intercom one, and I just have somebody waving me at the studio window. I'll be right back. <laughs> right. Uh, intercom. Okay, so the, the full one was open mics, contact closures, fire employees, if I had employees, uh, contest for people to call you through the Echo, add skills so you can do a ton of stuff on air, intercom from one room to I, So we all like the intercom. We all liked that when that was read. Okay, so I'll reveal <laughs> yeah, that, that name. Good. I'll reveal that name in just a minute. But I've got two of them to give away. So that 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 could be one. What's another one that sounded good to you? I realize I've, I had to buzz through these. There were so many. Um, I kind of like the one mm. where it monitors certain things. And if it go, something goes out of bounds, it'll tell you. I, I kind of like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that too. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not all sure how that works. So let's see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. That would be... Okay, so this one... Uh, uh, well, a couple people mentioned transmitter monitor. Um, and, and, and other things. And if something goes out of bounds, let you know. So I've got, let's see, this is, uh, hmm, and this is, uh, -huh. and two people mentioned, uh, monitor transmitters. Let me see if I can real quick find the other one and see if we can give a, a consolation prize. Uh, yeah. So we had two people actually mention that. All right. One, one got there before the other did. I think so. Here's our winners. Sorry, it's 13 after the hour. Uh, the first, the first winner is Tim Ingram. Tim Ingram, congratulations! I'll be in touch about shipping this to you. Tim Ingram, he had uh, the idea of open mics, uh, contact closures, maybe fire employees. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Uh, contest people okay. to call you through the echo. Add skills. You can do a ton of stuff on the air. Okay, and but the key thing there, intercom from one room to another. That would be an interesting skill. The other winner, Bob Holowenko. Now, Bob has actually been a guest on our show before, and is full nice. of great ideas. Uh, yeah, so Bob Holowenko, he's in Canada. I'm not sure if it's legal to send these to Canada. Hopefully it is. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And But but another gentleman had, an, had a similar idea about, about uh, monitoring transmitters, and that was Jeff Wiggins. Jeff, I have a consolation prize for you. It's a microphone, a condenser mic uh, that I have used on the show before. I've got I've got a couple here in my office, and uh, so um, that'll be uh, hope, Jeff. I hope that's good for you. Let me see. I can oh, this is a cool one. Ta da! That's for you, Jeff Wiggins, as your consolation prize. Okay. Okay. Good. I'll, I'll take care of the details on these things, and so congratulations to our winners, uh, Tim Ingram. Bob Holowenko and Jeff Wiggins. I think we're done now. Awesome. Are we done? Okay. <laughs> Chris Kern, of, co of course, the time went by way too fast. There's plenty more we could talk about, so I hope you'll come back again sometime, and we'll focus on maybe one subject. Maybe, you know, hey, I met you at that microphone display where I tried out, I don't know, what was it, 127 microphones? <laughs> yeah, it was like 10, 10 mics. Yeah, 10 right mics, okay. Yeah, that was awesome. That I was a podcast movement. And uh, we had a real, all the best, you know, podcasting mics, broadcasting mics, and well, not all the best, but a lot of them. That was really fun. And uh, by the way, just if, if people want, uh, what I wanted to mention with the Luffs conversation from before was that uh -huh. on one of my recent episodes of the Podcast Engineering Show, we actually talked about Luffs in detail and about how it actually evaluates the signal and all that. So, so the Podcast Engineering Show might be a good resource for. And people can well. find the podcast engineering show at what website? Uh, podcastengineeringschool.com. So that's okay. Just search for podcast engineering school and you'll find everything. I'll put that in the show notes and you've just mentioned it. So we'll make sure people know where to find podcastengineeringschool.com. You'll find podcasts there as well as you can sign up to take your course and become a podcast engineering expert and really, really improve your podcast game. All right. Yeah, hey, Chris Tobin, totally. thank Thanks, you Kirk. so much for being here. I, I, you haven't left yet, have you, Chris? I'm here. No, I'm here. We, we had a small problem. <laughs> drum kit I know fell apart. Hurt. Drum kit fell apart. Snare drum on the floor. It was a mess. Oh, no. Oh. Really? 
<laughs> it's okay no. now. They were waving at the window in panic, and <laughs> cymbals, hi hats went down, and snare drum stand <laughs> fell, and uh, it's it's good now. We're good. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> that's what well, happens when were they banging on the window to get equipment? Were they wanting to get you to fix it? And your answer is, I'm an engineer, not a drum kit fixer. Uh, well, I'd like to say that for fun, but no, I'm not Dr. McCoy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> cool. Uh, hey, thank you. Thanks so much to both of you. We'll, we'll be back next week with another uh, edition of uh, This Week in Radio Tech. Tell your friends. Thanks to Chris Curran. Thanks to Chris Tobin. And thanks also to uh, Suncast, our producer, for just, uh, switching the show and making it look good. I really appreciate that. And thanks to uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. We got to go. Thanks for watching. Congratulations to our winner. I'll be in touch. And uh, we'll talk to you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. <laughs>